Hi everyone, really excited to be discussing healthcare and AI opportunities, selling to healthcare providers and payers and systems, and preparing a pitch to a pre-seed investor on healthcare AI. Quick thank you to all who contributed to this knowledge piece with your insights, perspectives, and inputs. Before we dive in, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm a partner at Pair VC and leader healthcare practice. I also started the Pair Healthcare Playbook podcast focused on helping entrepreneurs learn from successful founders, leaders, and operators in healthcare. I also lead the female technical founder program that we run twice a year and have 150 founders in the community. Here's a picture of our community, a dinner with our healthcare founders in New York, and the Pair Healthcare Playbook podcast logo. At Pair, we partner with founders at the early stages and we invest in software and tech enabled services, innovating on care delivery. Our vision for Pair Healthcare is for aspiring change makers to value Pair as a healthcare partner to get from zero to one through making commercial introductions, recruiting first hires, and co developing product strategy. Our investing team has started 10 plus companies, and our platform helps su support founders through each stage, be it finding product market fit, growth, recruiting, or fundraising. We're the first check in healthcare companies that one, innovate on care delivery stack. For example, Recora is bringing cardiac rehab into the home, and this AI is focused on stroke detection using AI. Two, bolstering the healthcare tech stack, such as Vanta that helps with HIPAA compliance, ice layer on a lab infrastructure, and finally, bringing new modalities from FinTech to healthcare, including Budgie Health focused on simplifying employer benefits. Now onto what makes a good healthcare AI startup pitch. At Pre-Seed, team and founder fit, problem and source of insight and the why now are very important. First, to build a founding team requires building a multidisciplinary founding team supplemented by experienced advisors. This means focusing on complementary skill sets from technical to clinical to go to market. Finally, it's important to know why your team is the best position to solve this problem. Which goes to the next point. You need a very unique insight on a big hair on fire problem. And this only comes from lived experience or intensive customer discovery through interviewing 100 plus users, including clinicians, patients, pharma, payers, and decision makers. And it is important to focus on problem discovery before solution validation. You also need a why now. We're always asking why can you build something now that couldn't be built before? Is there a technology paradigm shift or regulatory shift? How does that make your product 10x better? And there are a lot of why nows for healthcare AI. The macro market for healthcare shows how big of an opportunity there is to innovate. US healthcare is a 4.1 trillion market and 20% of US GDP growing at 7.1% CAGR year over year. Digital health deals and deal sizes have grown tremendously in the last 10 years. I would note, although healthcare funding has corrected from unprecedented year of 2021, markets are still healthy. End of 22 surpassed 2020, and we're still seeing funding for healthcare, though at slower paces than 2021, in line with the rest of the industry. We're undergoing a platform shift with the advent of new LLMs and specialized LLMs such as Google's MedPalm 2 model, and Google's model scored 85.4% on a U.S. medical licensing exam in less than three months of scoring 67.7%. In their research, they also show that AI answers currently better reflects consensus than physicians, though there is more risk for inaccurate or irrelevant information than physicians. Further, medical AI algorithms are also being cleared at an unprecedented rate. Less than 73 AI medical algorithms were cleared by the FDA in, tw in two decades. But in less than five years, we've seen 900 plus medical AI algorithms cleared by the FDA. Physician and clinician burnout is also at an all time high, and we simply do not have enough supply of physicians. One of the top reasons for burnout is that physicians face too many bureaucratic tasks. Second is spending too many hours at work, and three, funnily enough, is increasing computerization of practice. So really need to find the right balance of bureaucratic tasks and computerization. Finally, regulatory changes in healthcare can really make or break a company. Here are a list of new regulations that have created a lot of opportunities for interoperability, transparency, and patient data. And we're also looking forward to new regulatory frameworks for software as medical device platforms and AI as a whole. Innovation is great in theory, 
but it can only be applied if healthcare organizations are willing to adopt. Go to market in healthcare startups is figuring out the incentives in healthcare. Who is going to be interested in paying, even if they are not the end consumer? We break down in the next sections on four key areas, incentives, decision maker, decision speed, and common business models for these six different go-to-market channels. Every buyer and startup is unique, and this is not representative of every scenario. The first channel that we'll cover is provider clinics. They're an interesting buyer for startups because they generally have fewer resources, so they're more likely to have a need to invest in productivity tools, and because they're often run independently or by PE firms, they have less bureaucratic sales cycles. Their incentives are often to increase profit margin, which means they're excited about revenue opportunities, cost savings, and increasing gross margins. Provider clinics, for example, also have staffing challenges and have interest in workforce retention. The decision maker is luckily often the clinic practice manager or the physician lead themselves. And general business models include the SaaS model, lead generation, percent transaction fees, if billing, or in the payment space. The second channel are hospital health systems. They're notoriously hard to sell into, and due to thin margins and their sensitivity to integration and clinical workflow changes, their incentives are really similar, but their pain point is more acute given the thin margins these systems are working out of. The decision maker is often an executive counsel making up of a chief information or technology officer, chief medical officer, or physician representative, and the hospital leadership team. And given the amount of bureaucracy at these large systems, and also the large impact a technology solution can have to the amount of integration and risk entailed, they're known to have slow decision-making processes. But the caveat is also depending on the priority and level innovation investment the system has. For example, if you're helping with physician burnout problem, they're probably more likely to pick up the phone right now. And common business models include CPT codes, reimbursement if patient care is involved, SaaS subscriptions, transaction fees, of payments, and lead generation. VizAI is a great example in our portfolio that uses AI to connect care teams earlier, increasing the speed of diagnosis and improving clinical care pathways starting with stroke detection. Putting your framework into practice, health systems are incentivized to have better outcomes and also cost savings due to workflow time saved. Now shifting to the payer world. There is an exciting opportunity to sell into Medicare and Medicaid Given these two government-funded programs are more value-aligned in improving the care of the patient efficiently and ultimately reducing costs in the system. My personal opinion is that Medicaid is a very interesting space to invest right now because Medicaid organizations are actually starving for innovation and startups pitching to them, whereas Medicare is a little bit more saturated. Further, they are encouraged to drive membership enrollment every year and sometimes by advertising their specific Medicare benefits and also member retention as retention drives the bottom line significantly. The decision maker is typically the executive committee or innovation arm. Decisions are also made by based on strategic priority. For example, one plan may be specifically interested in more maternal care and diabetes prevention programs if they do not have an existing vendor. Business models that are common with payers are PMPM models, often for engaged members only, and eventually transition to share savings models. I would also kind of bucket in the pay provider hospital types like Geisinger or Kaiser into this Medicare and Medicaid payer world, given that their incentives are, are a lot more aligned in this integrated care delivery network. Dr. Sasha Jane, CEO of Scan Health, on the latest Pair Healthcare Playbook, talks about how excited he is about AI eliminating potentially almost 50% of non value added healthcare documentation and increasing clinician capacity by 25%. Though they have a high bar, so, you know, I would definitely make sure that they have, they see a lot of ROI in your startup pitch. Further, clinician shortages are also created by a bad system, not just workforce shortages. So he's hopeful there will be greater efficiency in care propelled by AI-powered documentation, for example. Employer and commercial payers are also driven by similar incentives, but are more motivated by retaining um, attractive competitive employee benefits, improving patient outcomes for more productive employees, and employers are now very overwhelmed by startups pitching to benefits, and the economy isn't in totally a position to focus on retention, um, but they will pay for top five disease burdens by cost, which we'll talk about in the next slide. They also pay per engaged member per month and have typically cyclical enrollment periods, 
So I would say even though their decision processes can be faster than a government payer, they still are um, sometimes quite slow. Liz Bernstein, a pair portfolio founder from NeuroHealth, has lots of experience with speaking with employers and shared that United Healthcare recently released a report on the top five spend categories for large self-insured employers. These include oncology, MSK, cardiovascular, GI, and neurology. Digital health upstarts that help employers make a meaningful, quantifiable dent in these cost categories will have an advantage over other point solutions. Many AI companies need to sell into many stakeholders. For example, one of our companies, Baylor Labs, sells into value-based payers and oncology providers. Baylor Labs improves oncology decision support by building ML on pathology slides data. Payer and providers are incentivized to improve outcomes and also prevent downstream costs of the wrong drug choice. Second to last, but not least, pharma is a really attractive customer because they have higher margins than other go-to-market channels. Their incentives are focused on solutions that improve R&D and sales and marketing, and this includes AI-driven drug discovery assets, collecting real-world evidence, patient data, and recruiting clinical trial participants. The decision maker often varies for pharma, and there are multiple buyers and decision makers, such as the head of R&D and head of market access. They typically have medium to slow decision making and looking for existing data and product proof points. Their business models are often priced per patient or analysis or platform fee. BioEach is a great example in our portfolio that leverages AI to map longevity pathways and identify new drug targets. More successful drug targets is tied to reduce R&D costs, improving the chances for blockbuster drugs. And finally, consumers are the center of the healthcare universe, but they're paying out of pocket and it's really difficult to acquire cus consumers directly, especially scaling that over time. Consumers are interested in access to better quality care, and that often means more personalized care. I think that AI can be really helpful with that, and it's hopefully allowing them to scale down the affordability of personalized care. Consumers want more timely responses and access, and they decide quickly if they need something but they often won't be able to continuously pay out of pocket for more than a few times. And this is where even consumer teams eventually try to figure out a B2B path to make things a little bit more affordable for patients. And now on to healthcare AI opportunities. There are a ton of exciting opportunities in healthcare AI, and I break it into non-clinical and clinical workflows. Non-clinical AI workflows and AI and bio and pharma are less likely to have resistance and go to market and are promising areas with AI infrastructure and safety limitations continuing to improve. This includes the exciting new wave of companies replacing clinical paperwork, addressing the clinical shortage problem through prior authorization, scribing, and summarization. We're really excited about the opportunities in revenue cycle management and the various components related to making this process more accurate for practices, and it's close to the bottom line revenue for these practices. There's also a lot of exciting AI opportunities outside of generative AI regarding federated learning to create more effective models with consideration of private data sets. Other areas include specialized LLMs for healthcare use cases, whether that is helping to surf surface provider or pharma owned data to create compliant solutions for LLM solutions in healthcare settings. Here's a market map of a few leading players in the non-clinical AI workflow space. There's also a lot of excitement in AI and bio, including drug discovery, optimization of clinical trials, biotech and R&D collaboration tools. Here is a market map of a few leading players in AI and bio and pharma space. On the clinical side, though we are skeptical about the adoption of AI patient consumer tools, including patient education and a patient companion, we are excited to see developments in general AI models and how well they are able to interact with patients. The majority of patients use Google for self-diagnosis most of the time, so we think there is a better search tool for healthcare, but we really want to see how um, regulation comes into play and how do we build fine-tuned models that are safe for patients. Further, um, transparency and data regulation will pave the way here. Though there are more ethical and safety regulatory considerations for clinical AI workflows, we think the technology is already ready for adoption with the right team and precautions and clinical trials in place. There is a lot of exciting use cases that have been FDA approved or used in clinical settings, and we really think there is a lot of potential to drive better patient outcomes and solve the clinician bandwidth and shortage issue. 
Here's a market map of a few leading players in the AI and clinical workflow space, with emphasis on diagnostics and clinical decision support. AI is a really exciting time for healthcare, but given the rush of opportunities, our AI team wanted to ground ourselves in what is a defensible healthcare AI strategy and solution. At Pair, we're really excited to see startups connecting outcomes using AI input and skipping middle workflows. This is seen in both a healthcare use case and a non-healthcare use case. For example, Valor Labs skips the diagnosis piece to drug choice, and Causal skips the A-B testing to business KPI. Alex from Nabla on the Pair Healthcare Playbook had a really good point that it's easy to create a demo right now with a public LLM and do 80% of the work, but it's really about the 20% that's hard to do, which is fine-tuning their own elements and fine-tuning an open source large regression model with your own high quality data and understanding your business and go to market will really push healthcare AI products past text notes towards real automations of clinical tasks. Our AI team believes there will be an ensemble of specialized models fine-tuned for application workflows. These use cases will be powered by proprietary personalized data, customization of multimodal foundational models, and there also be a way of a company's focus on data and tooling to label, evaluate, and ensure safety, accuracy, and privacy of these models. The future of AI will need to be focused on addressing these following ethical considerations, from hallucinations, cost, removing bias, safer AI, explainability, and more. <laughs> So when will healthcare LLMs be truly ready for widespread clinical adoption? Vivek, lead Google AI researcher at MedPalm2, believes that there is a lot of work to do in terms of understanding the capabilities of these systems in real world workflows, and they're really excited to take on this journey. So even though it's easy to put out papers with a headline grabbing result, this doesn't really tell you how these models are useful in practice. Finally, how do you create a moat? Here are three areas the Pair Healthcare team is looking for, and they're very much tied to team, go-to-market, proprietary data, and fine-tuned models and solving for safety. We'll leave with the inspirational line from Viswesh of Baylor Labs. There are a lot of people who try to integrate these technologies or platforms into existing workflows, but everything that has become trillion-dollar companies were actually technologies that reimagined and rebuilt applications on the new platform. But Shwesh thinks that this is the opportunity, and he doesn't see anyone doing it yet, but he thinks that's where the opportunity or the most value will be created. So challenge accepted. Finally, product market fit is not enough. You not only need a problem someone really cares about and is willing to pay for, and a method to acquire these customers that are, you know, is repeatable and scalable, you also need a lot of people who have this problem. And that goes to the next point, market size. Simply said, you could have a whole deck on market size, but the main thing is number of customers times revenue per customer. And is that number bigger than three billion? Um, and we have a really great breakdown of market opportunity in healthcare from Bessemer, which really shows the differences between tech-enabled services and healthcare SaaS and the market opportunities. And healthcare is naturally a big market, but we really need to think about always doing the math, how many customers there are times revenue. And finally, market always wins. A great quote from Andy Ratcliffe. When a great team meets a lousy market, market wins. And when a lousy team meets a great market, market wins. And when a great team meets a great market, something special happens. As you build your startup, there are many milestones meant to de-risk the various steps in your fundraising process. Our goal at Pair is to get companies from pre-seed C to Series A. Please feel free to reach out with questions or feedback and feel free to reach out or subscribe to future content at the pairhealthcareplaybook.substack.com. Thank you so much.